welcome to the second Thursday forum at the St. Paul Public Library. Um, many of you know we've just started this in September and we're trying to have a, a monthly event that you can look forward to. Next month's gonna be Dan Chenard, a little different topic. The reason that we, we the, the title of this event is uh, Safety in St. Anthony Park and Throughout the City. Um, and those of us who live in St. Anthony Park have had a number of events recently that um, have made us uncomfortable. And uh, certainly Michael Brazel's death about a year ago, um, the carjacking at Ned's, um, and uh, I, I don't know, about two years ago, Marty Ruddy in South St. Anthony uh, was shot. That was also a carjacking event. And, catalytic, converter. catalytic converter, sorry, right. And then, um, you know, just even the cable car, the cables that disappeared from our chargers. So there's stuff going on. It's not comfortable. And I'd like to have a conversation about how we can feel safe and what we need to do to make, like, the uh, police position, that their job, uh, easier to, to do as well. So at the heart of the discussion is what actions can we take individually and as a community or as a city to ensure that we live in, a, in safe neighborhoods. Um, one of the questions is what does safety mean to us? Um, recognizing that feeling safe uh, is not the same as what the data shows you know, for, for example, when, when Michael was shot, people felt unsafe, even though the data would, would say not, not, it was a different story. Um, and then so, so recognizing those feelings. Um, and what we also want to do is how do we partner with community services to best res respond to concerning events? Um, we're going to have a little bit on statistics, I believe, um, little, uh, concerning uh, crime in St. Anthony Park and what the patterns are and what remain the same. Uh, as we approach this discussion, it's important to reflect on the fact that this library is located on a corner of St. Anthony Park and that as a neighborhood we include South St. Anthony and also the housing across 280. Uh, in university, so we're actually a, quite a large and diverse community, um, not necessarily reflected in the, the neighbors right around the library. Uh, tonight we have uh, three invited guests. Uh, first is Catherine Murray, who's from the St. Anthony Park Community Council. Uh, Linnea Jacobson from the St. Paul Office of Neighborhood Safety, and she is the Neighborhood Safety Community Manager. That is a city office that was fairly recently opened, and she'll tell you more about that. And also Stacy Murphy, who is the district chief of the Western District of the St. Paul Police Department. Um, so we are here to discuss those issues. We'll be presenting data, strategies, and other ideas to uh, address our concerns. To start, I'm gonna ask, ask each of you three to five minutes to describe what your role is in related to community safety in, great, in, in Greater St. Paul. Uh, and following introductions, we'll, make, we'll have, take questions from the audience. Uh, you should have a little card that if you want to write down the question. Um, Becky Ammerman is gonna pick them up, so if you just hold them up, we, we can uh, gather those questions. Um, and we hope to have a lively and informative discussion around safety issues. Um, shall we start, Catherine? Thank you, uh, so I'm Catherine Murray. I'm currently the executive director of the St. Anthony Park Community Council. Uh, this is actually within my last two weeks here, but I have been with the organization for uh, nearly six years now. Uh, and I previously lived in St. Anthony Park at the Carlton Artist Lofts. Uh, you know, for, uh, the past six years, you know, I've worked with uh, St. Anthony Park residents who are very passionate about making this better place. And the work that we've been doing together is very much community-centric. And that 
doesn't necessarily look like what you think of when you say community safety right off the bat. You know, community-centered safety initiatives, they empower the residents to feel like they have some control and feel like they know their neighbors. It introduces uh, programs and infrastructure and bringing people together in a way that as a community council, we try to do through a lot of the work that we do in our committees. And we have four standing committees that are environment, equity, transportation, and land use. And that's not necessarily what you're looking for when you say, we're going to have some safety initiatives here. But with the connection between those committees and community safety, it's intricate and it's multifaceted, and it's something that even the smallest event, like our second annual ice cream social, or the uh, CIB process and trying to get lighting on a bed, on a corner, um, or bringing in rain gardens to address you know water drainage and things like that, it all is connected to community safety as well. And that's something that we've had members who came in and understood that and got us some really good uh, programs happening in the last couple of years here that uh, go with that. We've put in new rain gardens. We've been trying to work with the city to bring in these uh, other safety initiatives. We've talked to uh, residents who are concerned about traffic speeds. They're concerned about the environment. They're concerned about uh, what's going to happen next uh, with equity issues and making sure people have access to food and making sure that people know each other within their neighborhood because people have stopped talking to each other. And be that from COVID or from civil unrest or whatever the reason, one of the things that we do as a community council is try to bring people together. And so that was why when uh, Rita reached out and invited us to be a part of this forum, I thought it was really important that we step up and say, yes, we'll be here. Okay, thank you very much, Catherine. Um, next we have Linnea, uh, who is here, Jacobson, who is here from the Office of Neighborhood Safety. Good evening, everybody. It's so nice to see everybody come out. I love it when I attend forums and things like that, and there's a there's a crowd of people like it signifies that you actually care and you want to get to the bottom of things and you want to hear more about what's being offered in your neighborhood. So I'm Linnea Jacobson. I'm with Office of Neighborhood Safety, which was established in 2022 by Mayor Carter. Um, he established the department off of the research and the suggestions from the Community First Public Safety um, Commission. I am, I have the privilege of being the manager of their Neighborhood Safety Community Council, which is a community council, 15 members of community members from all parts of St. Paul representing each ward in St. Paul. Um, we come together, we have meetings about alternative public safety measures, what programs can we implement. Um, we have community conversations. Um, with different like libraries, St. Paul Public Library, St. Paul Public Schools, um, St. Paul Alternative Schools, um, just hearing the problematic areas that they have concerns when it comes to safety. Our job is to try to work with the community to find alternative measures because everything doesn't necessarily need a public safety call, but that doesn't mean that it's not a public safety issue. So that's primarily what we do in my office. Um, the best thing about my office is I have also have the privilege of working um, with a team, a small team right now of six, but all of us, well, five out of six of us all grew up in St. Paul, um, running and hanging out at parks and recs and knowing your neighbors. Um, the majority of us went to the same school <laughs> at a different year. Um, we all know each other's families and friends because that's what St. Paul is. It's, it's a small town feel. It's a big city, but a small town feel, and that's the best thing about it. So when we are going out and we're working with people, nine times out of 10, we know them, or we know of them or their family member or live next door to them. So that's what makes my office special. Um, it creates a more personable approach when we are addressing public safety measures. 
Um, so that's what the Office of Neighborhood Safety does. Okay, thank you, Linnea. And last we have Stacy, who is here. Uh, Stacy Murphy, District Chief of the Western District of the St. Paul Police Department. Welcome, Stacy. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks again for coming out. I want to echo what the lady said before me. Uh, so again, I'm Stacy Murphy. I am the District Chief of the Western District, which is the district we're in right now. I have, I'm relatively new to the Western District. I've been over here in the position I'm in now since last December, so a little under a year. Um, I've been with the police department, however, for over 21 years. I tell people I started when I was 10. Um, but I've been here for a while, and I've held a bunch of different jobs. When I was working patrol, um, the majority of my time, about eight and a half years, was spent in the Western District, mostly on midnight. So I'm very familiar with the district. Um, it was kind of like coming back home when I went, came back over here as the district chief. As the dis district chief, I run the day-to-day -day operations of the entire district. There are two other commanders that also work in this district. There's the patrol commander, who is Dave McCabe, and the investigative commander, who is Sheila Lambie. In the back, if you didn't see it when you came in, there's a few handouts, and one of them I want to draw your attention to has all of our contact information on the front. So if there's follow-up um, questions you have, feel free to call or email any one of us, and we'd be very happy to talk to you about any concerns you have, anything going on that um, we can help you address. Patty Lammers is our crime prevention specialist who works specifically here in the Western District. She wanted to be here this evening. She is amazing, for those of you that may not know her. Uh, but unfortunately, she was out of town on a pre-planned trip. So there is a variety of um, handouts in the back that are really related to crime prevention. So how to keep yourself safe, um, what to look for, when to call 911, some of those different things. One of the things I would like to draw your attention to in the packet is in the very back, kind of the back two pages, um, there is some information about our camera watch program. So for anyone who isn't familiar with that, if you have a camera on your home, your garage, anything on the exterior of your home, and that's something that you're willing to share with us, you can sign up on that camera watch program. We would not have access to your cameras. What that would mean is if something happened in your neighborhood and we're looking for cameras, we, that's the first thing we go to is our camera watch program, and we would reach out to you and ask if you could check your camera and see if there was anything there. Um, obviously, we go door to door knocking, but sometimes people aren't home. So just something I like to draw folks' attention to because that is a really helpful tool for us. Um, cameras are a, a great thing. So if you have some and would be willing to share that information with us, I would encourage you to sign up for that program. Aside from that, there's a few other handouts in the back there. Um, if you have any questions about any of them, feel free to let me know and we can have a chat about it after or during the meeting. I guess the first question to me then, uh, what actions do we, can we take community-wide and individually to address safety issues? What, what do you want to see from the community? And that's really for any one of the three of you. Would you like me to go first? Sure. All right, I will go first. Um, so one of the things that I had just mentioned is our camera watch program. That is something that's very helpful for us. The other thing that I will say is call. So if there's something that you see that's going on that um, you know your community best, you know your neighborhood best, you know when there's something that seems out of place, so don't hesitate to call us. You can call 911, you can call the non-emergency number, which is 291-1111, but call us. If there's something we, if it turns out to be nothing, that's not a big deal. We would much rather come out and check into it and see if there's something going on uh, than waiting to wish you had called. So that would be my number one thing is call. Uh, there's some information in the back about personal safety. Uh, Patty Lammer certainly can come out and do some classes on that, but some of the things that we recommend is just paying attention to your surroundings. Again, you know your neighborhood and your community best. Get to know your neighbors if you don't already. I think a lot of folks already do. I know there's a, a lot of work done in various neighborhoods to make sure folks know their neighbors. But if, if you don't, I really encourage you to get out and meet your neighbors. Participate in things like um, Safe Summer Nights programs, National Night Out, the things that really get folks out and getting to know one another. That's going to help a great deal with personal safety and safety in your neighborhoods. 
We have another program called the House Watch program. So if you are going to be out of town on vacation, feel free to reach out to us. Patty Lammers is the contact for that. There is a um, crime prevention website on the city's intranet or internet, I'm sorry, that you can go to and fill out a form. But I can also, I'll give everyone Patty's phone number right now in case that's something you would like to do. It's probably easier that way. She knows I do this, just so everyone knows. Her number is 651-266-5455. So that will get you directly in contact with Patty Lammers, and she'll get you signed up for the uh, house check program if you're going to be out of town for vacation. The other thing that she can do, which is helpful, is she can do a premise survey. So if you would like her to come out, she's certified in crime prevention through environmental design. So she can come out and look at your property. She does homes, personal homes and businesses. But she can come out and take a look and see if there's suggestions she could make, like um, lighting suggestions, locks, doors, windows. A lot of things are pretty inexpensive. One of the things that we see, not necessarily so much in, in this neighborhood, but some of our really old homes, is they'll have key locks on both sides of their deadbolt, not something that is suggest, suggested or necessarily good for fire code, which is not the world I live in, but if they were here, they would say the same thing. Um, so those are some things that we can offer, and some of the things that, you know, if you take advantage of, it also helps to ensure that, you know, you're having some, some good safety in, at home and while you're out and about. And I talked a lot. So ladies, sorry. Yeah, I guess I would just echo the piece about getting to know your neighbors. And I know one of the things that uh, we're coming up against as a small organization that's trying to do community outreach and engagement is with the number of uh, large apartment buildings that are coming into South St. Anthony Park. And this is across the board. It's not just the St. Anthony Park problem. This is everywhere problem where there is uh, little that uh, it's being done by these management companies uh, and often by the community uh, organizations that serve these uh, residents to help them get to know each other. Um, you know, National Night Out is one way. There are uh, other, you know, community events that happen that get people out of their doors and getting to know each other. But one of the things that we've been trying to do is actually go to where people are and host community meals and host uh, other sorts of events that are happening in their building that will get them out and talking to one another. Uh, sometimes you, know, you get those residents who are go-getters and will help organize those things. And in that case, we say, well, go get a board seat. <laughs> <laughs> Join a committee, join an organization, volunteer, and get to know people who have similar interests to you because there are those sorts of clubs. And St. Anthony Park has a number of organizations and clubs and things that are either listed here at the library, there's on the listserv, there's, you know, right outside doing the garden club. And it's very fortunate to have those opportunities to find things that you might be passionate about and also get to you meeting your neighbors. So I would like to piggyback on that. Um, in addition to joining um, different organizations and different boards and different things like that to get to know your neighbors, for me, it's important to just get involved. Um, we're all busy, right? We, a lot of us, we're working Monday through Friday, full-time jobs. We've got kids. We've got grandkids. We've got parents. We've got second jobs, some of us. Um, it's hard to get involved, but we have all have an opinion about what's going on and what makes us feel safe and what makes us feel unsafe. We all have an opinion on how much involvement we would like to see um, crime reduced and, and, and more police presence and more block parties and different things like that, right? We all have an opinion and we all want to be involved in that, but how does that work? That actually means signing up to do something. One of the biggest issues that I run into is 
people want to feel safe and they have these great ideas on how we can feel safe and what programs we can implement. And then when I put out the platform like, hey, come to this or come serve on this committee and you can help us make the decisions about what we do to make things safe, sometimes I get crickets. And it's sad because I have ideas, you have ideas, everyone has ideas, but in order to implement those ideas, we have to use the platform that we're given. And the platform that we're given right now in my office is by Mayor Carter, where he says, I want to, I want to have a neighborhood safety community council. I want community members to serve on a council and make decisions about what we're going to do how much money we're gonna to put towards this after school program? How much money are we gonna to put towards these cameras? How much money are we gonna to put towards parks and recs to make sure that kids have a safe place to come? These are all decisions that the Neighborhood Safety Community Council gets to meet, gets to make. But we have to have people get involved. We can't just retreat to our homes because we feel unsafe and not use our platform. And so that's my biggest thing. When you're getting involved to meet your neighbors, also get involved to make a difference. Get involved to actually have a voice in what we're going to do. One thing that comes up again and again with uh, all of the, our board and our committee and as a community organization is that you know not only are we trying to fill board seats and we're trying to make sure we have a number of people on these committees and things like that, but the issue of funding is a big one. And the fact that there is a safety commission, I think, you know, helps kind of bring people who are having those kind of issues or wanting to help solve something, a place to go for those things. Because as a organization that is in one of the lower crime areas, we don't have access to some of the funds that other uh, neighborhoods get access to. And when you know things happen and tragedy happens and the neighbors turn to us and say, what can you do? It's very reactionary and very difficult to say, oh, well, we're going to have ice cream. <laughs> um, and it's going to solve all of our safety issues. Or we're going to uh, be you know, planting some more flowers and things that'll you know, soak up all those hard feelings. But when uh, the there's 17 district councils and every single one, whether they get those federal funds or not, are constantly trying to find ways and find uh, other partnerships to make this work happen because it is falling short. And it is an uh, issue that comes directly from, like, unfortunately, the city council representative isn't able to be here tonight, but uh, from those city funds that go to the community council. And they don't provide a living wage for staff. They don't provide enough to even really do true community engagement. And as we're trying to find uh, you know, these communities that are growing and we're trying to reach all of the people who are coming into the city, it's not only creating an environment where people don't know each other and it doesn't feel like a community, but it's also then adding extra stress to these small organizations that are all trying just to do some good. Um. Stacy? Yes. Could you repeat that non-emergency phone number? The non-emergency number? Yes, ma'am. 651 291 Eleven, eleven. What numbers are you looking at in terms of like all the new housing along University? Is that like how, how is that affecting the the number of people that you have to serve? Uh, sure. So the number of people that uh, we're looking to serve, if we're saying that we are serving the entire community, is drastically changing. It went from being a 40% renters to 60% renters when I came on, and it has completely flipped, and is continuing to be an increase in the percentage of renters. That being said, I mean, there are, I believe it was 2,200 uh, units that were expected to come in in five years as of 2019. 
Um, and that's not to say that it's just 2,200 people, it's units. And so that's one to four people if you're trying to uh, look at it in that way. And so it's difficult to say how many people are actually coming in because not we don't actually get the information about who is, uh, how many units uh, there are, how many people can live in those units, and we don't get the information of how many of those units are actually filled. One thing that uh, we recently did with the San Anthony Park Community Foundation's help was to work with the University of Minnesota's uh, community GIS, that's Global Information System uh, program, and we work with a student who had recently graduated to create a SAP data project, which we should have live here any day now. Um, and that's a dashboard that show, took uh, census information and a couple of other sources, and then also some of the information that we've just gathered as a community organization to help identify that gap because the housing that came in, we had four large buildings that came in right after the census data was collected. And so there are hundreds of people who were not included in that. And so when you ask that question, I say, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we're working on it. <laughs> I, this person says, I worry about encouraging see something, say something when there is a need to be aware of paranoia in this racist society. So see something, say something, I'm presuming you're saying you're seeing somebody walking down the street that you don't recognize that piece. Um, so we know that SAP people have uh, reported innocent people of color to the police for just being on the street. And even when you know your neighbors, uh, you don't always know. Um, even when you know your neighbors, people you don't know have a right to be on public streets. Okay, thank you, sorry. The folks that live in neighborhoods, work in neighborhoods, you tend to know the people that live there. You are absolutely right. We, we are a very inclusive city. We want to have people coming into the city to um, recreate, to go to our restaurants, to come and see friends and family and enjoy the, the parks and everything that the city has to offer because it's an amazing city. So on top of you know just seeing something unusual in your neighborhood, we really ask people to focus on behaviors. So what are the things that are really making you think that there's something going on. Is it, you know, in, in dark out and someone's walking around pulling on car door handles? Well, that's not generally normal behavior. So we're really talking about um, looking at the behaviors and what is it that's making you think that that person is up to something that they shouldn't be up to. The other thing that I will add to that is um, if there's, if it turns out the person was just you know, trying to, I don't know, find their friend's car or something like that, when we come out and have a conversation with them, we'll, fi we'll figure that out. And we do that all the time. It's not like we try to jump to conclusions. We, we really come in as a police department hoping for the best and just having a conversation with folks. And if they say, no, this is, I, I live right there or my friend lives right there, then that will be the end of it. So we again, really focusing on the behaviors. One of the sheets that we have in the back um, really talks about some of that. So it talks about some of the suspicious activity and some of the things to kind of keep your eyes out for, but really focusing on the behavior, I think will help a lot with what you're, what you're talking about. So anybody want to add to that? Or? Um, I don't have much to add on that one, but I will say that um, one of the things I think that we are really um, lucky here within the city of St. Paul is we do have a great police department. Um, our officers are always going through trainings and these trainings have a lot to do with de-escalation, um, actually like um, their approach. Um, our officers here in St. Paul are very community oriented. Um, they're at almost 
every single event. So nine times out of 10, if you call an officer out, they're probably familiar with that person. Um, so I think that it's just trusting your spidey senses, you know, take advantage of the form um, that you received from SPPD and look at it, evaluate, okay, what is something? What is suspicious activity? And think about that when you are seeing something or noticing something. The last thing we want to do is, um, I know right now we're really, really set on not making a mistake and stereotyping someone or assuming that someone's up to no good because they don't live here or we've never seen them before. We're really, really careful about that, right? But the last thing we want to do, too, is make a mistake and not say something, and then something happens. Nobody wants to make that mistake either. So I think it's just a matter of trusting your gut and then really being communicative with your, um, your 911 dispatcher on what you're seeing and what you're feeling and why you're thinking what you're thinking about um, these parties that may be in your area that look suspicious so that the more detail you have, the officer is gonna get. And so when they make their approach, they know what they're looking for and they have an idea of how they wanna approach the situation. So it's trusting your officer to do the right thing. Okay. Um, what, what changes are you seeing in criminal activity in St. Paul or in St. Anthony Park? And are you seeing, are we seeing the, the, the the new the new people living in the neighborhood in other words the, the larger population is it covid what what changes are you seeing um so maybe i'll talk a little bit about our crime stats there so <laughs> i think that's where we're going so I, I won't bore you with a bunch of crime stats i there is a lot of information that we gather as a police department as a city what i will say is and I'm, right now as I'm talking, I'm comparing 2022 to 2023, so the last two years. So year to date, we are down overall crime across the, across the city, everything, we're down 28%. That is a, a pretty significant reduction. That's violent crime, that's property crimes, that's everything, and that's across the city. Part one crime, so those are our more violent crimes, those are uh, murders, rapes, robberies, aggravated assaults, burglaries, thefts, those are down across the city 28.15% year to date. So what I will say is we're, we're certainly trending down across the board, moving specifically to the Western District. Again, compared to last year, year to date, our crimes against persons, so again, those are your aggravated assaults, assaults, um, kidnappings, those types of crimes, were down almost 12% in the Western District and crimes against property, so that's your um, burglaries, criminal damages, fraud and forgeries, uh, possession of stolen property, those types of crimes were down almost 25% in the Western District alone. A couple things that I believe that are helping to contribute to that is um, we're, we're getting less calls for service, so there are fewer, pretty much everything across the board is down. So our calls for service, our shots fired, our uh, property crimes, everything is trending down right now as compared to last year. We had a, a spike in 2020, so that was COVID, that was civil unrest, there was a lot of stuff going on during that time period. And ever since then, we have been trending down. So we did trend down again. We really peaked around 2020, 2021. We've been trending down. So that is a really good sign. That's, that's actually across the country. It's not just us. Um, it's, it's across the country. A couple of things that are unique in particular when you're talking about very violent crimes. So um, a lot of our firearms cases, some of our very... Um, uh, intricate narcotics cases is we've had a number of cases go for federal charging. That means that the individual, it, it, we're working very closely with the U.S. Attorney's Office on that. That means the individual is looking at a lot more time and there's a lot higher consequences. Those are, again, your carjacking, some of your firearms crimes, some of your very intricate narcotics crimes. So in 2020, 2022, 
The St. Paul Police Department had 15 cases that got federal charges through the U.S. Attorney's Office. This year, to date, we've had 39. So that's over double. So I also think that that's impactful. Uh, folks do talk to one another that are in this, this world, the very, very violent folks. It's, it's very few people that tend to know one another and that word is getting out. So that we also think is very good. The other thing that I would like to point out is in 2023, there is a, um, well, we, we've had this for a while, but there's a group called VSET. It's the Violent Crime Enforcement Task Force. So that's specifically Ramsey County. So the, the biggest folks that have staff in it are St. Paul PD and Ramsey County Sheriff's Office, but there are also other folks in other cities in Ramsey County that take part in that group, in that task force. That task force has gotten 13 federal indictments on cases that involve narcotics and firearms. So that's in addition to the cases, the 39 that I had just talked about. That is a really big deal. Um, we didn't actually even track that number prior to 2023 with, with VSET specifically because there just weren't that many. Um, so our officers, our investigators, the folks at ONS, all of our partners are working really, really hard to have a very laser focused approach on the very violent crime that we really saw peak in the last couple of years. And I think that that's really helping to trend our particularly violent crime, but all across the board in a downward position. So I think so that's what I had on that. I get a yeah. lot when people are uh, wondering about like the crime that's particular are uh, one being like, what is the violent crime rate in St. Anthony Park? And is that more in North? Is it more in South? And I know uh, from a previous community meeting that we had that it's not split up like that. And it's hard to dig down quite that deep. Um, but that is a question that comes up uh, when we're talking about safety. And the other one is about the green line and wondering if the crimes are separated from the things that happen on MnDOT property. Um, Metro Transit's, po pro sorry, thank you, uh, property, because with the, um, particularly during COVID and a lot of, I mean, it's always been happening, but you know, uh, people using, essentially using the train for a home and then that leading to people either being uncomfortable because there's somebody sleeping and obviously living on a train car or uh, on the flip side of that, on one end being like attacked or being robbed or something like that and how that gets tracked because it's like if there's a ball game somewhere, there's always more things happening. Obviously, there's more people, there's more opportunity for crime, and then there's also more things happening. There's more uh, noise complaints, I'm sure. There's, you know, things like that. And from what we had learned, we weren't hearing, we weren't seeing that reflected. And so I was just wondering if you could clarify on that point of how those two things get roped in. Yes, yeah, so there's a couple questions there. So I'll start with the, the data point. Um, so I don't have the specific data for just St. Anthony Park. We have several analysts that actually can narrow it down depending on what you're looking for. So if there are certain questions or certain data that you're looking for, uh, we can do, I can help you put in a data request for that. So we can actually narrow it down by grid. Um, so we, we have a map of the entire city and, and it's broken down into much smaller grids. So we can pull data based on that grid. So it requires a lot of work and not something that I can just do here in front of me. I don't have an analytical mind, but we have people that can pull that data. So if there's things you're looking for, let's connect and I will do my best to get you what you need. As far as the light rail, buses, um, any Metro Transit property, Metro Transit does have their own police department. So those crimes, anything that's happening on their property is all data that they collect. Again, any data when you're talking public entities is, it's public data. So there's certain amount of things that you can get by talking to their department, but any um, crimes, any, any of the stuff that you're talking about that's happening on the light rail, on their platforms, any of that is tracked by Metro Transit. 
What I will say, um, and I'm not going to speak too much because, again, I, I'm, it's not our department, but Metro Transit is working very hard to try to mitigate some of the issues that have been happening, particularly on the light rail, but also on the, on the um, buses. So they have added more um, officers. They have added some, and, and I apologize, I don't know what they're called, but um, they're some type of community outreach folks. I, I don't know what they're called, but they've added a number of folks that are really trying to work with the unsheltered or homeless individuals that are using that for their shelter to help get them resources. They have an outreach team with Metro Transit that focuses specifically just on that population, trying to get them into some type of you know, housing or resources or something like that. The person has to be willing to take it, but they're, they're really trying hard to work through that. They do want to have transportation that's safe for everybody that folks want to use. It's a, it's a great option. I've used it myself. I think that that's just, it's a, it's a work in progress, but I do know that they are really working hard to try to, to resolve some of those issues that they've been having. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, guns. What, what are you seeing in terms of uh, use of guns and uh, so safety in schools, safety in, in parks, um, the sale of guns and the ownership of guns. Do you have information on that? I sure do. So um, specifically as it relates to guns, so I talked a little bit about some of our violent crime, which a lot of what you're talking about falls into that category. Um, Non-fatal gunshot wound victims, so that's folks that were actually shot but were not killed. That number has gone down quite a bit from last year, so I'll give you the last three years. So in 2021, across the entire city, we had 179 individuals that were shot by gunfire. Again, that does not include our homicides. That's someone that was shot and they did not pass away. 2022, we had 193. And in 2023, 107. And again, those all numbers are year to date. So we're at 107. Still way, way too many. Uh, shots fired calls. So again, this is different. Um, this is someone called us and said that there was a shots fired and then there was some type of evidence that we found. So this isn't, um, if someone calls and said there was shots fired and it turns out to be fireworks, that's not included here. This was actually some type of evidence found. So in 2021, there were 2,611. Last year, 2022, uh, 2,256. And year to date, that's almost in half at 1,262. Again, we're talking across the city. And the last stat related specifically to firearms that I have is the number of firearms that we've recovered. Uh, so this is incidents. So if there's a particular incident that we recovered more than one firearm, it's only counted once. So just to be clear on how the data works. Uh, but in 2021, there were 639. 2022, there were 603. And so far year to date, there are 558. So that's across the city. Um, our homicide rate, which kind of goes along with that, although they're not, they're certainly not all related to firearms. But in 2022, we had 34 homicides across the city. And uh, so far this year, we have 29. And the caveat that I would like to say with that is um, the 34 number from last year, that is taking out um, your things like your justifiable homicide, so the things like self-defense. The number for this year, the 29, those are not removed yet because that doesn't happen until the end of the year because some of those are still waiting for determinations to be made. Um, so that number is going to flux a little bit and we do expect that to come down because we do anticipate some of those being considered or deemed justifiable, but again, that's a determination we don't make. Um, so those are kind of some of our statistics. Was there a second part of that question? I apologize. Okay. and um, we work heavily with St. Paul Police Department. Um, the, the trend tends to be that the gun, we're seeing the most gun violence 
with our youth. Um, the majority of our crime is being committed by our youth. I mean, I think it's probably a rare occasion that you guys actually drag somebody in there that's like 40 years old. I mean, it happens, but I'm, when I say youth, I mean ages 12 to 24. That's who are carrying the guns. That's who are um, the carjackings. That is who um, the fights turn into gun violence, um, retaliation. These are the things that are contributing to the statistics. And that's one of the things that our office is mainly focusing on um, is preventative measures. These kids need something to do. They seriously need something to do. They need more par parental involvement. Um, they need more... Um, they need more assistance with education. Um, they need more assistance with confidence. They need to be, they need to have goals. Like seriously, they need goals. Um, they need to be able to wake up every day and not want to do the things that they do because they have stability at home. They have the grades that they need. They have the aspirations to go to college. They have the aspirations to grow up and be healthy adults and have families and, and abiding citizens. And that's something that we've lost um, over the years. Um, it's been a problem. COVID just exposed it. And that is something that my office is working on is what kind of programs that we can implement to get youth involved in being um, healthy adults? What kind of mental health can we implement um, programs that gather, you know, that pull in mental health tools and have kids think about, okay, is this a healthy choice? Is this not a healthy choice? How can I handle this situation better? How can I feel safe? handling this situation? What can I do when I get to school tomorrow if something's off? These are the kind of conversations that we are trying to have. These are the conversations that we are using to decide on what programs, what, what, how much funding do we want to throw into different organizations. Um, we're big believers that we have a lot of organizations in St. Paul in the city of St. Paul, we have so many different departments that do things around public safety um, that the community is not aware of, but we also have a lot of grassroots organizations, community organizations that do things hands-on with youth that we can't, that we haven't tapped into or that are not, in their, or their organizations are not able to execute a lot of their programs because of funding. So that's another thing that our office does. We look for grassroots organizations um, that we can throw funding at to say, hey, we see that you're doing this for this neighborhood, but can you do it for this neighborhood and this neighborhood too? Hey, can you go into the schools and implement this program? So that's just one of the things that we're seeing as it pertains to gun violence is it's the majority of it is the youth. Um, and that's something that we're working on, but it's going to take, you know, it's that old saying, it takes a village, you know, and, and we're the village now. The other thing I'd like to just add to that, that it, it doesn't show up in the data, um, is the Office of Neighborhood Safety, along with our police officers in our Aspire unit, they work very, very closely with the group of individuals that she was just talking about. So you have that, that youth, and a lot of them tend to be very, very young. You have that youth that was just arrested with a firearm or came to school with um, you know, so, something that they weren't supposed to have. So this group, Office of Neighborhood Safety and our, and our police department, the folks working in the Aspire, actually get together. They get together once a week, but they talk probably multiple times a day. They're, they work very, very closely together, and then what they do is they will reach out to kind of the, the ancillary people, right? Like if, if I'm the person, well, I have my buddies and my friends that I hang out with, so they're reaching out to get resources, not just to that one individual, but the folks that they hang around with very closely to try to get them on a different path. Like how do we get them the resources and the, the help and the guidance and the mentoring to get them on a much better path where they never even go into the criminal justice system. If they've been arrested, we've missed them along the way. So we're really trying, and, and that's the really important work that these folks are doing, is to really look at you know those layers down and not just that one person that just got arrested or in trouble or 
you know, shot somebody or shot at somebody, but who is it that they're hanging around with that we can help not just them, but their family to try to get them resources to choose a different way. And I think that's really the work that they're doing that's so important in making such a positive impact. And I think that's what's really to help dr helping to drive down some of these violent crime numbers that we saw in the last few years. It's still, like I said, way too high, but there's a lot of great work being done to try to reduce that, and, and it's working. Okay, um, I have a question from the audience. Um, what services does the city and county have to help first-time juvenile offenders uh, to help them not reoffend? Right now, the Office of Neighborhood Safety is housed right under the city attorney's office. Um, and they are doing some amazing things over there. I mean, I wish I could give you more. I'm so in busy and engulfed in my own <laughs> department, but the city attorney's office is doing a lot of good work with, um, uh, to, to not have repeat offenders and, or first time offenders. Um, they tend to typically refer them to us um, after they go through the process of, okay, how do we keep this kid from going to prison, but um, is there a diversion program? You know, and that's when it usually comes to us and we'll work with the families or work with the kids. Um, we get referrals all the time from SPPD. Hey, we have this family or we have this group, you know what I mean? And then we'll work with them. But um, man, I wish I had more detail. It would be awesome to have someone here from um, CAO, but they are doing amazing things. They've implemented a lot of different programs into their um, their system to keep from having to um, take everybody to jail all the time, but make sure that this person is on the right path so that it's it becomes a good decision that they did not have to go. They turn out to like, be this incredible citizen, you know what I mean? So, but I really wish I could give you more on that. Um, the kind of measures that you're talking about, is there anything for youth offenders, like a parole officer that would, would help them, you know, maybe more than the first year, or, or can we, you can always call me? Is there anything? Um, so there is, I, I have to say, it really depends on the type and the level of crime, right? So if you're talking, kind of some of the lower level property crimes, the amount of um, ongoing resources that they get may be less than your folks that are doing your more violent types of crime. So the, the county, the city and county attorney's office do have some diversion programs and again, very much depends on the type of crime. If you're starting to get into and anything related with guns, they're not doing the diversion programs. If, if they've just shot somebody, that is something a little bit different. They'll still work with families to get them resources because those kids are going to be coming back out into our community. Mm -hmm. At some point, they will. Um, but if you're talking, say maybe they were arrested with a gun, but they didn't shoot anybody, but they, they made a bad choice, right? They, they had this firearm, although they didn't use it. That's something that may be some type of a defer, diversion program. So there are very intensive programs that are right here locally because we want to keep them in the community because that's where they're going to have their resources. And there's a lot of different options, and I apologize, I don't have the list with me, but there are a number of community programs that these kids will go to. Depending again on the type of crime, the victim has to agree depends on the type of crime. I want to make sure that folks understand that, but yeah. the victim will have to agree that this is something that they're willing to let this person do. Um, and then it, it depends. A lot of those programs, especially if you're talking some of those higher level offenses, they are ongoing. It isn't just go there to three meetings and you're, you're off the hook. It isn't like that at all. And if they don't follow through with what they have to follow through over the course of many months to maybe a year or longer, then they will get diverted back into the criminal justice system with some other type of, of consequences. So it's a very multi-tiered approach that they're doing. And again, it does seem to be working. Um, the, the recidivism rate for a lot, and I'm not going to give numbers because I'm not prepared to talk about that, but the recidivism rate for the folks that go into those programs is fairly low. Um, I've had some conversations with the city and county attorney's offices about that, so I don't know any of their recent data, but they would be really good to 
invite maybe at some point to talk more in depth about that, but there is a lot of really good work being done there in particular with our youth. Okay, um, thank you very much, Stacey. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the clock and I know that we need to be done in like about five minutes. I have one, one comment and I think it was maybe Catherine, maybe, anyway. Um, the, the difference between crimes that are for juveniles, whether they are city or whether they're county, just a real quick response on how, how those decisions are made. Uh, the level of crime is yes. the difference. So your petty misdemeanors and misdemeanors will go to the city, and typically your gross misdemeanors and felonies go to the county. There are some differences there, because um, they do have a, and I don't remember the name of it, but a joint agreement specifically talking about um, some of our violent crime, that they work very closely together, so there are some that each other will charge. Um, but again, that is my rudimentary understanding of their work, because that's not an area that I work in. Okay. And I said something wrong, please step in. Uh, and I just wanted to add, you know, in looking at prevention and looking at kind of uh, a step back view and why these things end up happening in the first place, and uh, one of the things that uh, multiple organizations try to address is hunger in uh, young children, particularly. And there's the Every Meal program that the Community Foundation and the St. Anthony, uh, Anthony Park Faith Leaders had done a fundraiser for during the Fourth of July parade and things like that actually puts foods right into the kids' backpacks to take home every week. And it's programs like that that, you know, fill the bill belly so they're not out starving and desperate and hungry. Um, but I think are places where people don't think necessarily like, oh, you leave the school and that's your main food source. And it's one of the like bigger systemic issues that I think can be a crime prevention measure. Um, also, just to call out the wonderful work that's done by our uh, Parks and Rec staff for the Rec Check programs and the S'mores program and the bonfires that they do for community gatherings and all of the hard work that those very few staff people do with the kids that just show up. Um, it really it is building community, it is crime prevention, it is creating a safer environment and it is important that we address, you know, the that our parks have the resources they need to keep helping our youth and our families and hand in hand there. We passed the bond. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> okay, I had just one last question real quickly. Uh, listserv next door, do those play a constructive role or do you see anything from that? I don't know that we monitor those. Um, to be honest, if we do, I'm not aware of that. I, I personally don't monitor it. Um, if Patty Lammers was here, she could probably give you a little bit better yeah. answer to that. Yeah, Patty actually had come to a meeting of ours, I think about a year or so ago, and that is actually kind of a problem where people will post about it online, they'll post it on Nextdoor, they'll post it on Facebook, they'll tweet about it, what, wherever, but they're not calling the police department when something happens, and it's not being monitored in that way. And so, uh, I mean, that was one of the key points that she made uh, multiple times is call it in, because <laughs> that's how they know about it. Um, and, you know, we do have a great moderator for the listserv uh, who tirelessly volunteers and makes sure that the listserv has helpful information and Yes, there's a lot, there's a lot. <laughs> but it's also, it, it, it is kind of a community tool in that way of the you know virtual kiosk kind of thing. Next door makes, not so much. Not so much. <laughs> um, and it's really hard to get off. <laughs> okay, um, we are out of time. Uh, I would like you to thank uh, Catherine Murray, Lyn Lynette Jacobson, or Linnea Jacobson, sorry, and um, Stacey Murphy for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you.